two. If you have a Chinese Bible, it's on page 95, and a Korean Bible, it's on page 83. And while you're finding those pages, just a quick note of celebration for Dottie and I. Um, several years ago, 2013, I believe it was, we had um, the first Chinese student that ever lived with us was uh, Diana Munli Luo. And Munli used to sit down here with Pam, and they became friends, and Diana helped with some of the video stuff when the video stuff was down here. But in more recent years, 2013, Anna Zhu came to live with us. Anna Zhu was from Nanning. Um, she came at 13 years old to live with us, and she virtually knew no English. I mean, virtually no English. And she went to Dexter High School. She was the first Chinese student at Dexter High School, and she was the only international student, only. I, I can't even imagine being an international. All of these students at least have many of their friends going to MCI. Anna was all by herself. And the first year, Dottie sat on the couch with her every night and tutored her, but a part of tutoring her every night was that Anna would just cry and cry and cry. And Dottie would hold her for 30 minutes while she just cried. The grief of being separated from her mom and dad at 13 years of age, the inability to understand anything in any of her classes was just overwhelming. This Friday, Anna got married. Aww. Anna got married. Um, 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 uh, she married uh, a boy, Alex, who's also Chinese. Um, she graduated from Bentley University last year. Su Min went down, and Su Min's at Bentley University right now, and Su Min and Anna have become good friends. But we just celebrated the fact that this young girl who we've had since she was 13 years old has um, gotten married to a wonderful, wonderful young man. So we're very happy. We're in Exodus chapter 3. I'm sorry, in your English Bibles, it's on page 60. And I may have given you the wrong number in your Korean Bibles, but we're in Exodus chapter 3, so the page number's close. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the, the place where you stand is holy. And then he said, I am the Lord the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word, it is our prayer that you would open the eyes of our heart. Help us to understand this, your word, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may be tired this morning. My students often go to bed at 2 or 3 a.m., so if any of you 
Hag Young, I'm talking to you specifically. If any of you fall asleep, it's okay. <laughs> if you fall asleep, it's okay. Um, what happens? What happens when we gather together here on Sunday morning? We meet with God. But do the words, we meet with God, hold any importance to you? Do they weigh on you? Remember the question or the comment that I made last week? Does the presence and the purpose of God weigh on you more than the presence and the purpose of the world and the flesh weigh on you? And so this morning, when we say we meet with God, does that weigh on you? Does the presence and the purpose of God weigh on you? Some of us come to church on time, some come late during songs that we don't particularly like. We wonder what we're having for lunch. If tears are in our eyes, it's usually because we're yawning in between something I'm saying or Andrew's saying during a sermon. We sing a, a song at the end of the sermon, and then for those of us with children or grandchildren, we are wrestling with them to make sure we get, have them all before we rush out the door. For others, we're rushing home to grab lunch. In my case, I'm rushing home to take a nap. <laughs> my contention is that the drama of meeting with God every week has been hijacked by our careless worldliness and our unbelief. Too often we sort of saunter into church a little bit drowsy, somewhat distracted between all the other things that are going on in our life. And so we come to church distracted, we sometimes leave church distracted. We are too often like Elijah's servants. Do you remember the story of Elijah? Elijah and his servants had gone to bed, and when the servant had woken up, he saw that the Syrian army had surrounded the city, and he was scared. And he wakes up Elijah and says to his master Elijah, we are surrounded by the Syrians. And what does Elijah say to the servants? He says, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And the servant sort of looks at him a little crazy and says, those that are with us, there are only a few hundred, those that are with us are greater than those on the hillsides around us? And so Elijah prays to God and says, Open his eyes. Open his eyes that he might see. And Elijah's servant's eyes are open. And he sees. And when he looks at the hillside, it is recorded the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. What the servant didn't see was that even though they were not visible to him, the angels of the Lord surrounded them. The angels of the Lord, the Lord himself was in their midst. The Lord himself was taking care of them and protecting them. Until Elijah's prayer, the servant couldn't see the spiritual realm. We sit here this morning, and all we see is four walls. What I'm asking you this morning is to use your spiritual imagination. Because much like Elijah's servants, although you cannot see them, the angels of the Lord are surrounding us, and the Lord himself is present. The Lord himself is with us.
And so our prayer this morning is, Lord, open our eyes. We come to Exodus chapter 3. It's the story of Moses and the burning bush. It takes place on the backside of the desert, not far from Mount Sinai. Here it's referred to as Mount Horeb. Here's what you need to know by way of a background. Moses grew up, as we covered last week, Moses grew up in Egypt. He was born to Israelite mother and father. But he was raised in Pharaoh's court by Pharaoh's um, wife, and he became, and he's referred to as Pharaoh's son. And as Moses grew up in Pharaoh's court, he identified with the Israelites. He knew he really wasn't an Egyptian. He knew his mom and dad. He knew he was an Israelite. And he eventually went back. He left Pharaoh's court, and he spent time with his people, the Israelites. And in the midst of that, because of where he grew up in Pharaoh's court, he thought he could be the rescuer of the Israelites. And so he goes and he's spending time with the Israelites, and he sees one of the Egyptians trying to harm an Israelite, and he kills the Egyptians. And then he goes and tries to solve other problems among the Israelites. And the Israelite says, who made you judge over all of us? We saw what you did to that Egyptian. Are you going to kill us too? And Pharaoh himself wanted to kill Moses because he had killed an Egyptian. So Moses leaves the area and goes to a place called Midian. And in Midian, he meets Jethro. And he marries Jethro's daughter, Sephora. And they have a son whose name means a sojourner in a foreign land. Moses is now on the backside of a desert tending sheep. <clears throat> Moses is 80 years old. First 40 years he spent in Egypt. The next 40 years he's in the desert, a sheep herder for his father-in-law. He's well past retirement age. When we reach a retirement age, when we reach 80 years old, we're on the downstretch, the final turn, rounding the corner. We've been collecting our Social Security for a few months, and some of us, Don, I don't know if that's true for you. There you are, Don. <laughs> You're not very good at, at bowling, we learned this morning. But we take up pickleball because we're on the home stretch and we don't have to move too much. And yet a lot of us don't make it to 80s. Something happens, cancer, stroke, heart attack, COVID, an accident. You lie down to take a nap and you never wake up. It happens. Charles Barkley used to say, father time, father time is undefeated. That's true, father time is undefeated. And yet, here we have Moses at age 80 about to get his marching orders from God. And what happened at the burning bush 3,500 years ago changed world history. It changed world history. So let's see what happened. It first of all starts in verse 1. Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. We're not sure where Midian is today on a map. We know it's in the Sinai Desert. It may have extended all the way into present-day Saudi Arabia. So it's on the east side of the Gulf. And when we think about Midian, we're talking about a very barren place, sort of like being on the backside of the moon. It's nowhere, nowhere. I remember the first time my brother came to visit me in Maine, and, and he's an architect and works around the world, and he lives in Pittsburgh. The first time he came, he pulled into my driveway, put his hand on the uh, uh, roof of his car and put his head on his roof of the car. He says, Jay, why have you moved to this God-forsaken place? <laughs> well, that's where Moses had moved to, <laughs> the backside of the moon. And Midian was a dangerous place. It was hot. There were predators. 
Water was scarce, and if you were without water, you could die quickly. And that's where Moses spent the next 40, the second 40 years of his life. Everything in this story reminds us of one fact. Moses meets God on an ordinary day in an ordinary place. Moses meets God on an ordinary day in an ordinary place. It's not as if he got up that morning and said, my whole life is about to change. At age 80, he was probably thinking to himself, I've been shepherding for 40 years, nothing, nothing is going to change about my life. How many of you have thought that at your age? Be honest with yourself. I'm where I'm at, Dexter, one of the towns around Dexter, and nothing's going to change about my life. But Moses' life was about to take a sudden turn. So here's Moses doing his job in a remote place, doing what he's always done day after day after day after day for 40 years, and he doesn't have an inkling that God is about to speak to him. And while Moses is taking care of his family, taking care of his business, God is about to change at age 80 the trajectory of his life. That leads me to an important insight. 99% of our lives are ordinary. It's the same old stuff, isn't it? Day after day after day. You get up in the morning, If you're bald, you take a shower, get washed, so that you're clean. I don't even have, I don't, I'm, Dottie, I'm foregoing showers. <laughs> you put your clothes on, you eat breakfast. If you have kids, you get them ready for school. If you're a student, you get ready for school. You go to work, you read a paper at night, you watch TV, you eat supper, you go to bed dead tired. And then you get up the next morning and you do it all over again. That's the way life is. It's the same thing day after day. So many of us, we want to have a mountaintop experience. We want to have the experience that the Jesus Revolution movie indicates that some of us, myself included, were having in the late 60s, early 70s, or Asbury College in more recent days. Often we say, God, just show me your will. Show me your will. And what we sometimes mean by that is, Lord, give me some feeling, some insight, some spiritual revelation. Let me be caught up in the clouds so that I know that you're with me and I know what you want me to do. And God says, I've already shown you my will. And I've already promised that I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you. And so when we meet together here, it's just not the four walls. We're meeting in the presence of God. So what is God's will for a student? Might I suggest, do your homework? What God, what's God's will for a doctor? To take care of patients that are in their care? To do their very, very best work? What's God's will for a pharmacist? Fill those prescriptions and make sure they're right. No room for error. What's God's will for a teacher? Put together your lessons plans. Come to class. Passionate to teach. Passionate to teach. If you're a young mother and you want to know what God's will is, it probably has something to do, at least at the early ages, with dirty diapers. God's will for young mothers is more than dirty diapers, but it's, it's not less than that. God's will for a teacher may be more than teaching, but it's not less than that. God's will for a student may be more than showing up for class and studying, taking a test, but it's not less than that. So what's God's will for Moses in his ordinary life? 
taking care of the sheep, finding water for he and his family and the sheep, keeping the wolves away. God's call came to Moses during ordinary day, doing ordinary things, doing ordinary obedience. The same is true for you and I. The same is true for you and I. The story begins on a completely ordinary day. But then there is this extraordinary bush in verse 2 and verse 3. A bush in the desert is not extraordinary, but it's extraordinary that the bush burned but was not consumed. And that's what caught Moses' eye, his attention. It was strange, but more importantly, it was incredible. And so Moses approached the bush. Now, throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Exodus, but in other books as well, there are what in theological terms we call theophanies. Theophany is a term, a Latin term, used to express the fact that in the Old Testament, God sometimes <coughs> made a physical appearance through a form, in this case, through fire. Other times we read a pillar of fire. Other times we read a cloud. But there were physical appearances of God in the Old Testament, but often in the form and the presence of an object, such as fire. And so you can find them. Uh, throughout the scriptures. I won't give you all the things. I think some of them are up there. But you also notice that not only was the fire burning, but in verse 2, it tells us that the, that the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, the angel of the Lord is an interesting phrase in scripture. and We don't have time to get into it this morning, but the angel of the Lord is sometimes referred to an angel. An angel is the messenger of God, and so oftentimes God used angels to be messengers. The angel came and appeared before Mary to tell her that she would conceive and bear a son. In the Old Testament, angels were used also, but sometimes this phrase, angel of the Lord, means God. And it oftentimes refers to the pre-incarnate Jesus. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but in the Old Testament, it appears that God in his mercy and grace had an appearance of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem. This angel of the Lord is thought by most, and I would agree, that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And the reason we come to that conclusion, because as you look at a number of scriptures, this angel of the Lord, whether it be in Genesis 13 or Genesis 15 or Daniel chapter 2 or Ezekiel chapter 12, has the power to forgive sins and is sometimes referred to as the Lord, as in this case. Because in verse 2, it's the angel of the Lord, but if you go down to verse 4, what do you find? The Lord. And so this is more than likely, and I'm convinced that it is, an appearance of Jesus. So first there's this ordinary day, and second there's this extraordinary bush, that doesn't burn, in which Jesus, the angel of the Lord, appears to Moses. And thirdly, there is this personal call in verse 4 and 5. You need to pay attention to when Scripture repeats a word twice. When we were in Isaiah chapter 6, and we were talking about the character of God holy, that God is holy, Isaiah uses a term and says, holy, holy, holy. No other character characteristic of God is raised to the third power, only his holiness. And so when something is repeated, it has meaning. And in the Semitic culture, when you repeated a name, person's name twice, repeating their name twice meant a term of affection. Now, sometimes I repeat my grandchildren's name twice. Caleb? Caleb? That is not a term of endearment. I'm repeating their name to get their attention because they're not paying attention. In the Semitic culture, when you repeated a name twice, it was a term of endearment. It was a term, a term used to say, I love you, I care about you. Moses, Moses. And so God 
calls out to Moses. And when Moses heard his name used in this way, he would have known that he was being addressed by somebody who loved him. And that's important to consider because oftentimes spiritual events can be very frightening. And so in the midst of this spiritual event that could have been very, very frightening, God uses a term of endearment, of intimacy, of friendship. It's unlike the Wizard of Oz. Do you remember the Wizard of Oz? Pam does. She was there for the premiere showing, 1939. <laughs> I shall find more <laughs> <clears throat> When Dorothy, when Dorothy the lion and the tin man and the scarecrow finally make their way to appear before the great Oz, they're trembling because everything about this scene is so surreal and scary and they've told them they, you can't approach the great Oz. And so when they come before the great Oz, he's hidden, supposedly hidden, he speaks magically who dares to come into the presence of the great Oz? That's not what happens here. Moses is introduced to God with great love. Moses, Moses. God is all powerful, but he's also a God of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever should believe in should not perish, but have everlasting life. When God calls Moses, Moses responds by saying, here am I. In the Hebrew, the word is hinani. Here am I. I'm ready to serve. What do you want me to do, O Lord? It's what a servant says to his master. Hinani. Here am I. It's what a little boy says to his father, here am I. It's what a believer says to the Lord, here am I. And when he says, here am I, think about it. God calls him from the bush. He says, here am I. He has no idea what God is about to ask him to do. No idea. God is going to send him in front of Pharaoh. God is going to tell him to tell Pharaoh the ten plagues. God is going to have his people, take his people out of Israel, being pursued by the Egyptian army, and cross the Red Sea. He has no idea about the Ten Commandments. He has no idea about 40 years in the desert, wandering. He didn't know because he didn't need to know. He didn't need to know because he was speaking to the Lord God. We have a hard time with that notion because we always want to know what the future is going to be. Yes, Lord, I'll follow you, but who am I going to marry? <laughs> I'll follow you to go anywhere, but Lord, I don't want to go to Dexter. I don't want to go to Maine, but I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but I don't want to go there. We want a guarantee of success before we're willing to follow the Lord. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to go, but make sure that I like what you're going to do with my life. Please check in with me so I can give my okay to what you're about to do in my life. But that was not Moses. Moses didn't need to know about the challenge ahead of him because he didn't need to know. And the same is true for us. You don't need to know. All you need to say is, here am I. And notice, after Moses' reply, God teaches him another very important aspect of his character, his holiness. The immediate response from God was, do not come near. Take off your sandals. Take off your shoes. I'll do that, Pam, because I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm clean. Do not come near, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And Mo Moses learned in that moment a lesson which 
is communicated over and over again in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God is not like you and I. He's not. And the difference between you and I and God is dangerous. I've used this illustration before. C.S. Lewis has written a chronicles, or has written the chronicles of Narnia, one of which is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Some of you had that as required reading in your, um, in your schooling. Sometimes when children are still in Japan or Korea or China and they want to read an English book and they, see, they ask me, what books should I read to prepare to come to America? This is one of the books that I suggest. And this is a scene out of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. <clears throat> Susan speaking. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. But not often here, you understand. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve? That's why I brought you here. I'm to lead you to where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan, a man? said Mr. Beaver, certainly. Certainly not. I tell you, he's the king and the son of the great emperor. Don't you know who is the king of the beast? Aslan is a lion, a, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Then you will, dearie. And no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without shaking their knees, they're either braver than most or simply silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about the king being safe? Of course, he is not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You take your shoes off in the presence of God, metaphorically speaking, because he's the king. He is holy, holy, holy. He's not safe, but he's good. He's merciful, he's kind. He sent his own son to pay the penalty for my sin and your sins. We don't have time today, but the writer of Hebrews talks about two mountains in chapter 12. And the first mountain he says, which is Mount Sinai, might Horb, the people in the Old Testament could not approach that mountain because God's presence was there, and if they touched the mountain, in that day they would die. And the writer of Hebrews says, we are approaching not Mount Sinai, but we are, Mount Sinai, but we are approaching Mount Zion. We are approaching the kingdom of God. And in that day when you approach the kingdom of God and the presence of God, you will not die, but you will live. And you will live because... God is holy, 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 and we as unholy people can't enter into his holiness, into his presence. But through Jesus, Jesus pays the price for our sins, and he clothes us with his righteousness. He clothes us with his holiness so that we're able to now approach and be in the presence of God without being vanished, without dying because of Jesus. Go home this afternoon and read Hebrews chapter 12. And the writer of Hebrew also tells us that we, like Elijah and his servants, are joining thousands upon thousands of angels and their chariots, worshiping the Lamb, even Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews, as I said in the beginning, is telling us to use your imagination. 
Use your spiritual imagination. As you come to worship, you're just not sitting in a room with a bunch of people that you know and are your friends. You're sitting in a room where God promises to be present and you're surrounded by angels. Now, how does this truth impact our worship Sunday morning? The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 tells us this in verse 28 and 29. Let us offer God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe, for our God is a consuming fire. All God asks is that when he calls, we answer. He nani, here am I. Lord, here am I. I'm in your presence. I am in awe of who you are. Here am I. Send me. Let him fill out the details of where he sends you and where you will go. Trust him. He is the Lord God. He is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks this morning. We give you thanks for the beauty of your scripture and for what it teaches us about ourselves and teaches us about you. Father, we want to worship you. We want to be in your presence. Make us more mindful than we normally are that even though we come to this place casually, this is not a casual place. This is the place where we meet with others and we meet with you. Help us to give reverence and awe to being in your presence. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.